First reading comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there was a pool, a pool called in Hebrew Bethsaida, which had five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, Jesus said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, saying, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. So Jesus said to him, Stand up. Take your mat and walk. And at once the man was made well. He took up his mat and he began to walk. Jesus' permission, without ever asking Jesus to heal her. 
She kind of steals Jesus' healing power. Although Jesus immediately notices what happened and he, he assures her that he is okay with it, saying that her faith has made her well. But what if I told you that Jesus once healed a man who didn't really want to be healed? <laughs> because in that, mess, that, that passage that I read just a moment ago, in the fifth chapter of John's Gospel, you'll find the story of Jesus healing a paralyzed man. He encounters this paralyzed man next to a pool that sand. The pool would have been surrounded by people with all kinds of, of different illnesses and afflictions of body and mind because legend had it, there was a legend that stated that when the water began to bubble and swirl, the first person to enter the pool would be healed. But the man that Jesus talks to has been begging by this pool for the last 38 years. And so Jesus asks him, do you want to be healed? The man replies, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm making my way towards the pool, someone always steps in ahead of me. And then Jesus says to the man, stand up, take your mat, and walk. Immediately, the paralyzed man isn't paralyzed anymore. He is able to stand and to walk. But what if this man didn't actually want to be healed all that much? There's plenty of evidence in the story to suggest that that's the case. First of all, when Jesus asks the man a direct question, do you want to be healed? Jesus does not get a direct answer. Instead, Jesus gives excuses. Right? You might expect the, the, the paralyzed man to say yes. You might expect the paralyzed man, in fact, to give a very emphatic, almost angry answer. Like, how dare you ask me that question, sir? Of course I want to be healed. What do you think I'm doing here? But instead, he just gives excuses as to why he has not been the first one in the pool for the last 38 years. And on that note, how is it possible that at no time in the last 38 years, 38 years, that's how long I've been on this earth, <laughs> at no time in 38 years did someone offer to help him into the water. Not once in 38 years did the other people around the pool say, oh, wait a minute, I'm pretty sure it's that guy's turn. We can catch the next one. I mean, I know, I know that there are jerks in every millennium. But even, even back then, people knew how to wait their turn in line. It's also worth pointing out that after the healing, he does not say thank you to Jesus. You would think that if he really wanted to be healed, you would expect a thank you, right? You'd expect an, an emphatic, heartfelt, over-the-top thank you. But the final clue, the biggest clue, that this man didn't really want to be healed is that the next time Jesus sees him, he is once again sitting on his mat, begging for money at the temple. He can walk now. But he's still sitting on his mat. He can work now. But he's still begging. Doesn't that seem strange? I mean, now, now that Jesus has healed him, has liberated him from his affliction and given him the freedom to go anywhere and to do anything. He can go anywhere and he can do anything. And what does he do? He picks up his mat. He walks to another part of town, sets his mat down, and goes right back to doing what he was doing before. Jesus heals the man, and all he does is go right back to doing the exact same thing he has done literally every day of his life for the last 38 years. If I'm right, and this man didn't really want to be healed all that urgently, it begs the question, why not? Why would this man prefer to be paralyzed? Why wouldn't he rejoice when Jesus gave him back the use of his legs? I don't know, because the scriptures don't tell us. But my guess, my guess is this. I think that he was...
was so accustomed to a life of begging, to the life of being paralyzed, that the thought of changing that routine after 38 years terrified him. I mean, think about it. He had spent 38 years of his life doing the exact same thing every single day, day after day after day after day. At first, at first, he probably resented being crippled, being forced to bed. But at some point, that would become routine for him. And then after a little bit more time passed, that routine would have become comfortable to him. And then after even more time passed, that routine itself would have become a source of comfort for him. That routine would have become a source of comfort for him. I think that this man found the idea of a future where he could literally go anywhere and do anything terrifying. I mean, suddenly, he has to take responsibility for himself and his life and for his future at the very moment that his future has just become a lot more uncertain, when he can no longer count on the routine and the predictability that his future used to have. People are like that. We prefer our routine to change. We prefer certainty to uncertainty. We like predictability in our lives, don't we? It certainly gives us comfort. In fact, we like predictability so much that sometimes we will avoid making changes that might actually improve our lives just because we're trying to avoid the uncertainty of the unknown. That's true of us as human beings. And it's also true of churches. It's also true of churches. Churches are some of the most tradition-focused institutions that you will ever encounter. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I mean, the whole reason that the church exists is to preserve and to pass on a tradition. That's the whole reason the church exists, to preserve and to pass on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only reason that the world still knows the story of Jesus' life, the only reason that we still have a record of Jesus' teachings, this man who lived 2,000 years ago, the only reason that that exists in our world today is because his earliest followers made it a point to preserve and pass on that tradition to subsequent generations. But there is a danger in being that focused on tradition. The danger is that churches can and often do become obsessed with preserving every tradition, not just those that propagate the gospel message. We prefer the stability and certainty of doing things the way that we have always done them. You know, during Lent, we often talk about the, the seven last words of Jesus as he was dying on the cross. You know what the seven last words of a dying church are? We've never done it that way before. <laughs> I think that's why the paralyzed man went back to his mat. He was scared. Scared of this new and unfamiliar way of being in the world that Jesus had made possible for him. He had never lived that way before. Jesus healed the paralyzed man's body, restored the use of his legs, but he was still paralyzed. He was still paralyzed because he was paralyzed by fear. Fear of an uncertain future, fear of taking responsibility for the outcome of his life, fear that if he didn't take respons if he did take responsibility, that he might fail. Contrast the story of the man who refused to walk even when he could, when he could, with the story of Peter, who walked out onto the water. <laughs> Peter is already dealing with so much fear and so much uncertainty. He and the other disciples are on a boat in the midst of a terrible storm. The wind is howling, the, the waves are buffeting the ship. They're afraid that their boat might capsize. 
And suddenly, out of nowhere, someone or something starts approaching them on the surface of the water. And they think it's a ghost. And they get even more scared. When Jesus finally yells to them and tells them, it's me, it's Jesus, Peter calls back to Jesus and says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Do you know what I love about this story? I know I say this all the time, but this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. <laughs> There's a lot of good stories, and I have a lot of favorites. But, but I love this story because I love, I love that Peter, when he wants to know, is this really Jesus coming towards us? When he wants to test the truth of whether or not this person walking on the water is in fact Jesus, what he essentially says to Jesus is, Lord, if that's you, then command me to do something impossible. Command me to do something that terrifies me, and then give me the power and the courage to do it. I love this about Peter. In the midst of all of that uncertainty and fear with the storm raging, their eyes unable to believe what they're seeing, Peter wants to go deeper into uncertainty. He asks Jesus to call him out onto the water, too. And so Jesus calls him out onto the water. He says, come. Come to me, Peter. And Peter begins to walk on the water. Peter makes progress walking on water. But not much. <laughs> After he goes a few steps, his fear grips him. The, the reality of what is going on sets in. It's almost like, you know, Wile E. Coyote when he runs off the cliff in the cartoon. <laughs> when he finally looks down, that's when he realizes and gravity catches up, you know. He begins to sink. He cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches out, catches Peter by the hand, and pulls him out of the water and onto the boat. You don't know that Peter is not his real name. That's, that's not his given name. That's not the name that he was given at birth. His actual given name is Simon. He is Simon, son of Jonah. Jesus. Jesus was the one who gave him the name Peter, which is an English transliteration of the Greek Petra, which means rock. As in, when Jesus said, Peter, you are my rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Can you imagine what a hard time he must have gotten from the other disciples after he <laughs> stepped out on the boat and started singing? Hey, Peter, I guess you really are a rock. You sure sang like one, man. <laughs> and yet, and yet, Jesus says, Simon Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. What does that say about Peter? And much, much more importantly, what does that say about the church that Jesus Christ intended to build that he chose as its foundation a sinking stone? What if Jesus was trying to make it clear to his disciples that right failure, right failure, is more important than getting every single thing right. I mean, think about it. Peter, Peter failed eventually to walk on the water, but first, he overcame his fears. Peter eventually <laughs> failed, but he failed to try to do something that all of us would agree is impossible, and even then, even then, he succeeded in doing the impossible for a while. <laughs> Peter didn't make it all the way to Jesus, but he got close enough that by the time he stumbled and he fell and he said, Lord, save me, he was close enough that Jesus could catch him by his hand. Friends, I submit to you the idea that even if things don't go according to plan, any failure that gets us closer to Jesus is not really failure. 
and a sinking stone can be the strongest of foundations if it leads us to reach out and take Jesus' hand. This last year has been a rough year for our church. We had to navigate a global pandemic, changing how we worship, not worshiping together in person. We went through a season of discernment that had us asking hard questions of ourselves, having hard conversations with one another. And some longtime members left the church. But what if we were to use this last rough year as an opportunity to reach out and take Jesus' hand? I feel like God is calling this church into a season of renewal, of reinvigoration, of new life in Christ. I feel like we have an opportunity to step into uncertainty with courage and to do things in ways that haven't, we haven't done them before. Maybe to try new things that we've never done before. As we continue returning to a pre-pandemic normal, I'm going to be restarting the, the pastor-led Bible studies that I was doing, we're going to start those back up in June. We are going to start our dinner church services back up in June. We're, we're going to do that. We're going to have another session of the, of the UCC's White Privilege Let's Talk curriculum that was so meaningful for those who participated in it last time. We're going to be restarting some of the things that we used to do, but I want us to think about new things that we might do. What are new ways that we might help the members of this church draw closer to Jesus, to be more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ? And more importantly, how can we share this new life in Christ that we have experienced with the people of this community, with the people outside of these walls? How are we going to live out that great commission to go and make disciples of all people and all nations? We have an opportunity now, friends, we have an opportunity to evaluate our traditions, to ask whether or not they are still serving our mission. And I have to say, this might seem like a stupid and small thing, but I was so incredibly proud of the decision that this church made to postpone part of its cleaning day that we had already scheduled in order to let the Boy Scouts come in and use our building for their Pinewood Derby. Because we need to remember that this building that God has blessed us with, it is a resource that God has given us. A space to worship, and more importantly, a space to serve the people of this community. We put our cleaning day on hold, so that when the other venue canceled on the Boy Scouts, they would still have a place to do their Pinewood Derby. Not every church would do that. We have an opportunity to do things differently and to try new things in order to better propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the reality is that some things won't work out. Some ideas that sound good on paper, they won't attract people and touch people in ways that we might hope. But that's okay, because I truly believe what I said before. Any failure that gets us closer to Jesus is not really failure. And a sinking stone can be the strongest foundation if it leads you to reach out and take Jesus' hand. There's a Teddy Roosevelt quote that I love and I want to share with you all. Roosevelt once said, It is not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, and who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who actually does strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best in the end knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. 
so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. My friends, I believe that God is calling our church into a season of renewal. I believe that we have a unique opportunity in this season of renewal to build on the successes and even to build on the failures of the past. And in the name of Jesus Christ, whose church this is, I invite you to join together in exploring new ways where we might better love God and serve our neighbors together. Let's not be like a crippled man who used his opportunity to just move his mat to another part of town and sit right back down and go back to doing the same thing. Let's be like Peter, daring to approach Jesus even in the midst of uncertainty so that we can attempt to do the impossible. And even if we fail, trust that his hand will be there to reach out and catch us. Let's be like the man Teddy Roosevelt described, so that at best we will know the triumph of great achievement, and at worst, if we fail, then we fail while daring greatly. This is not a time for getting caught up in the past, because we have work to do right here and right now. If the Church of Jesus Christ was needed 2,000 years ago, my friends, it is absolutely needed today. If the world needed a voice for peace and compassion 2,000 years ago, then it surely needs to hear that voice today. If people were in need of meaning and purpose in their lives 2,000 years ago, then surely they still crave that new and abundant life in Christ today. May we not be timid. May we be courageous. May our discipleship be marked by daring greatly. There's a legend told by the rabbis that when Moses stood at the Red Sea, raised his staff, and commanded the waters of the Red Sea to part, nothing happened. Not a thing. Nothing changed. The waters remained exactly as they were. Until after a while, finally, one man, in faith, began to wade out into the water. Step by step, the water came up to his ankles, then to his knees, then to his waist, to his chest, to his neck. And still, he kept stepping further and further away from the shore, deeper and deeper, until the water reached his nostrils. And then, only then, in that moment, did the waters of the Red Sea part. I don't know what worries occupy your mind and weigh on your heart. I know that we like the comfort of the familiar and the routine. But I also know this. God is calling us to be daring. And I also know this. You are not alone in this journey. We are in this together. We, together, are the church of Jesus Christ. We, together, are the body of Christ in the world today. So let us keep moving forward one day at a time, one step at a time. In faith. Because our God has promised us that it will all work out in the end. And if it doesn't, then it's not yet the end. 